Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on the regional perspectives on digital governance. My name is Nadia Chekhian. I'm a PhD fellow at the United Nations University, and I'm very happy uh, to welcome our um, currently uh, three speakers, um, Nibal Idlebi from UNESCO, who is joining us online, Luis Barbosa from UNU EGOV, who is sitting here on my left, and Jamal Shaheen from UNU CRES. I'm also uh, happy to, uh, to uh, introduce our online moderator, Morten Meyerhoff Nielsen. Um, so if you are online and would like to ask us any questions, please don't hesitate to leave us any questions in the box so that we can have an active discussion about today's session. In today's session, we would like to address three key questions. How can UN regional commissions and other regional actors contribute towards managing the global public good? The second question we would like to address is what ways do regional actors mitigate the current shift in discourse and policy toward national reactions or so-called digital sovereignty? And lastly, what differences exist between global discourses on cooperation and practical implementation at various levels from local to regional and beyond? If you are, have any questions, thoughts, doubts, solutions, <laughs> please do come up and uh, ask us a question online or ask us uh, a question by coming up to the microphones in the room. We are very happy to, for you to uh, join the discussion and very keen to listen to the input from the wider global audience. So we'll start with question one and I will ask uh, uh, Jamal Shaheen to start preparing uh, his first thoughts towards this. How can UN regional commissions and other regional actors contribute toward managing this global public good? Perhaps you can give a little bit of a, an introduction to um, how we can um, look at this concept of global public good. Okay, thanks, thanks Nadia, and um, uh, we're very happy to, to be here. Um, and uh, to participate in this open forum. I think in the format of the open forum, I should be um, brief, and I've already taken up my two minutes, but um, <coughs> in, the, in, this, in the spirit of this, I would uh, like to rather just raise a few points um, and then pass the baton on to my colleagues. So um, we ask the question about uh, governing a global public good. Um, and I want to get to that, um, that kind of uh, unpacking that concept later on. But maybe I could start by saying that um, the intention behind this panel um, uh, and the discussion that we're having here is to really try and address um, how global issues can be addressed more successfully at the regional level or uh, can be started to be implemented at the regional level. And we talk about UN regional commissions, and we're very, I'm very happy that Nibal is on the call uh, to share her experiences with us. But there's also different regional actors that play a role. Um, so um, in addition to the UN regional commissions, you have technical actors who work at the regional level, um, such as the internet registries. You have um, also economic actors that work um, at the regional level, such as the European Union or, or, or different regional trade associations or, um, that work together. And I think that's one of the things, you know, the, the, the beauty of the diversity of this idea of regional plays in there. Um, at UNU Chris, which is where um, both Nadia and myself work, um, we have been working on a project that's been financed by the Free University of Brussels, where we look at global and regional multi-stakeholder institutions, and we look specifically um, at those kinds of institutions that engage with different actors rather than, uh, or a multitude of actors, rather than looking very much at the diplomatic or the economic um, framing themselves. And in that, we actually tried to develop, or one of the things that we tried to do was also look at how norms principles and practices flow from the global level to the regional level, and we termed this cascading governance. Um, and we look at how um, uh, these, these um, ideas that are transmitted at the global level can be pushed through. Uh, some scholars have termed this following through on policy, or, um, or, or yeah, following the policy, let's say. 
Um, this allows for specific flavors of those global norms to emerge in the regional setting. Right? And that is one of the things that we're seeing in the, in the contemporary uh, global situation, where we're seeing that global norms sometimes don't really hit the floor running when it comes to different national implementations. And so we think that using regional commissions as a kind of translator of these global norms can help there. I think there's a few caveats that we need to add to this idea. So regions must uh, share common interests and values, um, and they must be able to adopt, and the actors that play within those regions must be able to adopt those flavors of uh, global norms in similar ways. Um, and I said I'd get back to the global public good issue. And, um, we're talking about global public goods, right? Um, and the IGF has shown, I mean, just walking around and participating in some of the panels today, you realize that the notion of the internet as a global public good is actually quite contested. It's not, it's not, it's not the, we, we don't have the same kind of feeling that we maybe had 20 years ago in this space. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things we also need to address when looking at how regions actually interact with internet governance and, and the sphere of the digital in general. Oh, well, my computer's turned off. Um, we, we do know that the notion of a global interconnected network is a global public good, right? And that um, um, needs to be, you know, we need to make sure that we're clear in what we're actually trying to govern or what we're actually trying to cascade in our governance mechanisms. Um, I think that uh, Nibal and uh, Luis will have lots more to say about this framing and how that actually plays out in different regional and national settings. And I've spent five minutes talking, so I'll be quiet now. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Well, thank you for sharing your uh, kind of opening insights regarding this question. And I would like to move to Luis Barbosa. Please, could you um, share your remarks? Sure. Is it? Okay. Okay. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, we um, at when we go, we have a more practical experience. Uh, we have not this um, this kind of more conceptualized project. But I, um, I will start to say that there was a well-known mantra from the 70s, uh, um, think globally, act locally, if you remember, that although it was coined for a very different purpose, uh, still makes sense in this, in this context. Um, actually, there are a number of fundamental issues and global changes, challenges that require to be articulated at a broader even continental level, and I, I will focus, it's a pity that Maktar is not, has not shown up until now, but I think the, the African case is uh, particularly significant um, because Africa is witnessing an ever-increasing digital divide and sufficient in digital infrastructures, often targeted by predatory private interests from the West or from China or both. Uh, and actually the fact that the African Union uh, Digital Transformation Agenda has uh, put uh, uh, one of its main objectives to, uh, to have a continental fund, an investment for supporting the digital infrastructure and that IGF Africa this year has made again the same kind of, um, of statement uh, is a message very clear for, for, for us. Uh, at WNUGOF, we, we have some experience, we mainly <coughs> work with countries, but we have also some experience in trying to, to work at a more regional, uh, interconnected level. Uh, some years ago, we uh, managed a big project we did in the Africa, Lusophone uh, countries, and some, uh, I, I, at a later stage, I can share some, some lessons learned from that process. And uh, uh, this year, we, we launched what we call the uh, West Africa Digital Governance Forum. Mm -hmm. That was a way to um, to try to bring countries on the same table, uh, try to discuss some pressing issues and mainly to foster synergies and discuss what strategies can be drawn at that more integrated level. Uh, just uh, just two remarks, and I will I will end up for now. Uh, first is that although. Uh, this uh, regional, continental, international level is really very important. One of the lessons learned that uh, we, we have is that even if countries share a number of common problems and common concerns, 
they need to be addressed in different ways, in different countries, in different contexts. And this contextualization is something that cannot be swept under the carpet when we discuss an, an integration level. Um, Multi-stakeholder involvement in concrete uh, contextualized scenarios with appropriate uh, co-creation mechanisms for, for strategies and uh, action plans is something that very essential and that should be taken into, into account if you want to to think at a more global global level. And the second issue is that actually, uh, I think, but um, maybe you could, 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 could uh, certainly has much more interesting things to say, but I think regional integration, uh, or even <laughs> before integration, any sort of coordination efforts uh, are often difficult to achieve, and they require consensualized objectives, and more than that, consensualized practices. Uh, not only at, on the macro-political level, of course, political will, uh, coherence of policies, all this is very important, but also at level of motivating citizens and the civil society in, in the different countries for that, so that uh, um, strategies, processes, policies can be m validated, motivated, and we can build trust around these things. And uh, trust is actually something that actually um, moves people. For example, in, 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 in Cape Verde, we, we worked uh, in with um, a cross-border, okay, the cross-border issue, more than that is the diaspora problem uh, in Cape Verde that goes to Europe, that goes to other African countries, to even to the States. And uh, um, so we, we try to, to, to uh, motivate the design of uh, portals of service that somehow allow um, these people to, to have their lives uh, uh, simplified. And uh, uh, the, the presence of the, the, the citizens' associations dealing with diaspora and they, their involvement in the process uh, at, at different levels in Portugal, in Cape Verde, in, uh, even in the States, uh, was very important for the, for, for the success of this initiative. So I, I will do these two remarks. Things uh, uh, require a clear, uh, political, but also social or civic will to, to go to go to go around, and uh, anything we do should be articulated with the the, the, the context, the concrete context of the countries involved. Okay. Thank you very much. It's important to sh be able to share these kind of also practical examples of how things are working on the ground and kind of the feelings that we're kind of engaging with. That it's not always about. Um, the the manner in which we design uh, concepts and ideas and how we have these perspectives, but also learn and uh, with lived from lived experiences. And this is why I would like to uh, go to our online uh, um, speaker, Nivo Idlebi from UNESCO. Please, uh, I would love to hear your remarks. Sorry, there seemed to be a small problem with Nibal picking up the connection. We are trying to let her into the forum. Oh, she was there. She is at, he's, she's there, but she's not picking up. Ah. <laughs> so um, it seems our online speaker isn't available right now. So um, I just wanted to uh, encourage all the people who just joined us here in the room and also for those who are joining us online, um, we are looking at uh, three questions here today. And if you have any comments or thoughts or doubts or even perhaps solutions or what you want to see for the future, uh, we do encourage you to come in and, and join perhaps at the table or at the microphones so that we can have a little bit of a discussion about these three questions. So the first question that we started with was how UN regional commissions and other regional actors can contribute towards managing the global public good. And we already heard from Jamal Shaheen from UNU Chris and Luis Barbosa from UNU EGOV. But then we will also look at question two. So to examine the ways in which regional actors can mitigate the current shift in discourse and policy toward national reac reactions, so so-called digital sovereignty. Um, perhaps we'll um, go into this uh, second part, and perhaps you could even bridge the, between the two questions. Uh, Jamal Shaheen, please. Thanks. Thanks, Nadia. Um, okay, so um, 
yeah, um, the ways in which regional actors can mitigate this shift um, towards um, the national reactions. Well, we heard from Lewis that actually these national implementations are actually quite crucial. In so the, the, the lived experiences, as you mentioned, Nadia, um, and the, the, the kind of the national way of implementing this is actually very important. But I would want to make an argument for actually this kind of, as I mentioned before, this cascading, so this bringing mm. down of the different norms from the global to the local via the regional. Um, one of the reasons why I think this also has a very important role to play in the discussions that we have is that um, although we talk about the internet or the connected digital network as um, a global public good, there are many um, instances in which national states or national actors are actually taking it upon themselves to manage this global public good in different ways. Right? And that may be on, uh, on different layers in the internet field. Nepal should be uh, with us now. Um. Yes, good morning. Ah, okay. uh, good morning. Well, okay. okay, there I is a problem in the video, but I mean, I'm here. Good morning, everyone. And uh, uh, I'm really happy that we are here. I mean, it's early in the morning in Beirut, but I mean, I'm here. <laughs> um, Thank you for including ISQA in this discussion. And I would like to say that, uh, if in, fact, uh, in fact, the regional aspect in uh, the public good and especially in internet and internet governance, it is really very important. And ISQA, we have been working on uh, this aspect since very long time, in fact. And uh, uh, we have noticed the importance of the regional aspect uh, as compared also to international. Uh, let me say how the, the, the we uh, maybe you are aware or some people who are listening are aware that uh, ESQA together with the League of Arab States, we have created what we call Arab IGF, which is really a regional regional uh, the, uh, platform for the discussing for discussing all issue related to internet governance. And uh, in this regard, we have noticed the importance to discuss to disseminate, to promote the global idea at regional level. It was really, I mean, uh, very important because people, many people and or many stakeholders in the at national level are not aware about some concept or they are re feel far away from the international discussion or the global discussion in this regard. Therefore, I believe uh, the first and the most maybe uh, the the first role uh, in this regard was really to disseminate the idea, to discuss the idea, to explain some some uh, some idea which are taking place at a global level, and that I mean need to be um, um, from first of all to be explained, and then to be con contextualized. Uh, I would say, uh, considering the the regional perspective, the regional social dimension and the uh, political dimension in some cases, to 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 reflect on how this will be integrated, uh, 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 how we, it, it can be integrated. Um, then, I mean, uh, then the, the prioritization at the regional level also, it is really very important aspect that we discovered that maybe some challenges or some, uh, some idea that are taking place uh, uh, and maybe they have a high priority at international level. They might be different at regional level because maybe some basics uh, uh, are not yet uh, well established at regional level and in this case in the Arab region um, because ESQA are, is working on uh, at the Arab region level. Uh, then the prioritization, it is really very important also and to see what matters for the region considering the level of development. Although sometimes we have, we witnessed a lot, some issue because the region itself, it's not harmonized in terms of development in, in many, in many area. I mean, uh, in technology and in some other area as well. 
um, then it is really this prioritization is really not important and it is important to reflect it at a global level. I would see that I would say that uh, the regional dimension is is uh, important for two ways. Uh, for uh, taking, I mean, the global and making contextualization to at the regional level, but also to 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 be the voice of the region in the international fora, and to 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 hear to make the the voice of regional uh, of regional aspect be heard at a global level because the matters might be different and might be might reflect other dimension that might not be really uh, uh, at the uh, uh, in in the international dimension are discussed well. I mean. Uh, for example, one of the issues that we have identified in our last uh, Internet Governance Forum, it was the access, uh, I mean, meaningful access to Internet, I mean. And this may be the access, it is not really a problem at uh, in Europe or in, uh, in the Western uh, countries. Why? It is still a problem, a major problem in, the, in, the, in some Arab countries, not all, in some Arab countries. Uh, I will not spend too much time, but in addition, then I mean, in addition to what you, I have said, uh, then I believe uh, the regional di uh, uh, commission and in this case ESQA, we have made also, I mean, a kind of roadmap for the uh, for the public good and the, and for the internet and for the Arab region roadmap on how to enhance the uh, internet governance and how to tackle all the issues that are. Uh, uh, discussed at the uh, international uh, fora. Then, uh, for example, legislation was very important. For example, privacy, cyber, even cyber security is very important. Uh, then, because it is still maybe not well, uh, quite mature uh, in many uh, in many countries in the region. Um, then, this is, I believe, uh, uh, to, to start, I mean, as the, the first dimension, I uh, repeat, dissemination, promotion, and also discussion, prioritization is really very important, and explaining. Um, the discussion with the international stake, with the regional stakeholders, I would say that uh, ESQA does, doesn't work alone. We are interacting with all regional stakeholders, with all regional uh, associations, uh, either professional or NG, uh, NGO, uh, or even a private sector association or academia sometimes, and of course with the government, with, uh, which are the main stakeholder, but we include all, all other stakeholders, including youth, I mean, uh, some association for youth. Um, I think I will stop here for now, and I will return back to other aspects uh, later on. Well, thank you very much for your insights, and I find it very important what you raised regarding these two ways. The first one, providing the, co the context in which uh, these concepts and ideas are on a regional level, but also representing the voice um, of that region. And uh, it's uh, admirable what you're doing with the um, Arab IGF and what you were saying about the roadmap. We would love if you could leave us the link in the Zoom chat and also uh, send that to us so that we can add that to the IGF webpage so that people can actually learn what is this roadmap and what from your region have you um, found uh, is progress will allow us to progress towards uh, a more inclusive um, future. But then I would like to uh, go into question two. The question, uh, question two looked at examining the ways in which regional actors can mitigate the current shift in discourse and policy toward national reaction, so so-called digital sovereignty. And I would like to return to Jamal Shaheen to make any further comments yeah, if he thanks. wishes. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. Um, yeah, maybe just bouncing off something that Nibal said, I'd like to emphasize the um, importance of the two-way street, right? It's not just about um, um, uh, disseminating global or filtering global norms, but it's also about ensuring that regional interests do get brought up to the, the, the fore. Um, uh, maybe if I go uh, back to this issue of digital sovereignty, um, of course this is a term that's been used in the past couple of years uh, around the IGF, around different uh, fora, um, to actually try and show how states themselves can actually build um, 
their own approaches to understanding how to regulate uh, the global public good that we're talking about. Um, and here you see that the, 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 there are tensions inherent in a kind of model uh, that links the global with the local. So we, we, we think global and work locally, but if we do too much work, work locally, then uh, the global may be forgotten, and then we forget to think um, globally. Uh, we, we don't forget to think. Um, but in that sense, the regional as a kind of uh, filter can actually show that international cooperation does work. Right? And I would be very interested also to see how the different regions learn from each other. So, I mean, Nibal, uh, you are the representative of all of the regions. <laughs> and you actually mentioned that you do work with different stakeholders. And I assume and I know that you work with ECA, um, with ECLAC, and so on and so forth. It would be really interesting to actually find out how those interactions work in order to actually nuance the discussions that we have on, on digital sovereignty. Maybe one thing I could add, and this is linked to, uh, uh, Sophie's just walked into the room, so I, I have to reference her now. I can't plagiarize. But she'd already mentioned to me something about the different ways in which this concept is actually used in regions. So you have regions like the European Union, which thinks of digital sovereignty as being um, uh, about managing complex interdependencies, right, or managing interdependence. And then you have in the uh, African Union, you have the Fund for Digital Sovereignty, which is actually promoting national strategies um, in this area, but that's a regional organization doing that. So you also see this concept being brought up in different ways as well, um, uh, according to different regions. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if um, um, if you, uh, Louis, if you would like to provide any further insights regarding this question. Yeah, I, um, uh, um, taking again what Nibal was saying, I uh, I think there are there is a path uh, that inter international organizations can can do uh, with three different dimensions, and one is exactly the the representative, the voice thing that Nibal was. Uh, pointing out which is very important. The other, I think, is synergetic. The success of this kind of, uh, um, I mean, the way that we can somehow contradict the more national-based discourse is to address this kind of key enablers of digitalization that are essential for, for, for people, uh, infrastructure, connectivity, uh, mobile payments across countries, cross-border problems, all these kind of, of um, of um, issues, um, and, and the other is pedagogical, if I yeah. can use this term, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that, uh, for example, take and going into question two, digital sovereignty in, in Africa is typically framed uh, as an extension of national sovereignty, okay? Uh, and with uh, firm roots in this political conception that comes from the Chinese model, if I can, if I can say so. And this is, um, yeah, of course, there is also an economic dimension. They try to protect the, the value chain, uh, their own value chain, all, all, all these kind of things. Uh, and this is very clear from all the documents from African Union, from, um, uh, for example, Rwanda's uh, national strategy or South Africa uh, policy in data and cloud. Um, this, is, this is very clear that the, the stress on self-economic self-determination uh, ensuring local ownership uh, and control over, over their assets. Uh, but we, we all know that this, this has uh, uh, different, different interpretations. For example, data localization is very important for, in all these strategies and, uh, 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 and for countries uh, as well. Uh, is a is a coin with <laughs> with double face because in, in often it uh, it represents a will of uh, okay we own our own data we are protecting our citizens or maybe you are just uh, having a easier way to spy on our citizens yeah? so does it make sense to discuss data localization in small African states by themselves? Uh, could, couldn't we do some pedagogical way of going a little bit further, optimizing resources, and mainly try to, 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 to put in action a more um, uh, s 
civic, citizen-oriented way of understanding what uh, digital sovereignty means. So this, uh, I think that all these three uh, free, uh, dimensions, the, the representative, the pedagogical, and the, the, the synergetic, uh, should be taken into account as a way of going around the more nation-based, uh, exclusively nation-based uh, discourse that is dominant in a at least when we talk with ministers and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and national agencies. So we find ourselves with more questions to our question. And uh, that only makes it uh, more interesting. And therefore, I would like to ask Nibal if you would like to uh, shed more um, insights regarding the work within your regions. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, um, thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for the active discussion. I mean, exactly. We have maybe more discussion, more uh, question than uh, than answers. Uh, this is the, the, the era that we are living in. Um, uh, however, I would like, I mean, uh, uh, to return back to this national sovereignty and uh, in the context of Internet and uh, and so on. I, I believe there is um, my what is interesting at the national level is really also to to make to activate the discussion at national level among the different stakeholders. This is something that doesn't happen all the time, uh, uh, naturally, let us say, because the terms that uh, some some aspect are some of them are taboo still in some countries. I mean, then there is, I mean, the need for to activate the discussion among the stakeholder. And this is really very important. Um, and we notice that at the Sometimes there is reluctance at the beginning, but then later on people, uh, uh, government and other stakeholders are quite well engaged uh, if uh, in a way there is uh, some insistence on this regard uh, or there is uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, how to say, the, uh, t you need to mediate the discussion and to explain, as I mentioned uh, earlier. And this is really very important uh, because we witnessed the importance of this. Um, I believe another dimension maybe that is maybe even f in our context was important is to build capacity, to ca capacity building. Some capacity building are very important because people need to understand maybe uh, some, uh, some aspect in better way. Um, uh, for example, we worked many uh, for uh, for um, with many countries at uh, at legislation level and uh, to and the implementation and the enforcement of legislation that is really needed uh, uh, in, in in some cases. Then I believe uh, then uh, the uh, uh, discussion with the uh, um, high level decision maker is really very important. Uh, to 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 uh, to provide uh, some um, justification or maybe sometimes explanation of this uh, 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 the what is taking place at international level, um, uh, putting the stakeholder together. I mean, and making them interacting together. It is not easy sometimes, uh, and this is where. Um, uh, sometimes where the, regi the regional commission or some other, other regional uh, stakeholder might play a very important role because some p sometimes we notice that discussion doesn't take place at national level unless there is intervention, external intervention, let us say, or extent external intermediator uh, to, to, to have the discussion taking place. Sometimes there is a need for some guide to have uh, this uh, the, this discussion uh, then this is what I uh, I will I would say at this stage and I believe uh, uh, in the in the Arab region uh, based on some uh, uh, some study that we have made some discussion the forum that we discussed then there were a lot of uh, better awareness uh, let us say, among different stakeholders and among citizens uh, on these aspects that are really important and some NGOs or some citizens, they are uh, raising more their voices uh, towards uh, to, to, to get uh, some rights uh, uh, and to have their rights on the Internet in better way, uh, especially in terms of a freedom um, and the Internet, the access to Internet and the freedom of expression and uh, and of all, of course, uh, cybersecurity or uh, the, the 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 related to topics. And I would stop here for the time being, not to monopolize the <laughs> the, the discussion.
Well, we're very glad to hear your thoughts and ideas. And uh, it, it's a clear request and a clear need for a, a more meaningful uh, participation. And I believe also that uh, Jamal wanted to uh, provide further input or further reflections. It's a discussion. And we also welcome members of the audiences. If you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, or um, perhaps solutions that you would like to see for the future, then you are very welcome to come up to the microphone or to leave a question in the uh, chat. So in the meantime, Jamal, yeah. please go ahead. Maybe I just wanted to bounce off some of the things that have been said, and thanks very much. Um, one of the things that I think also the added value of the regional approach is that um, in some parts of the world, what I've in 2000, between 2015 and 2017, I was working on a project with the European Commission called JIPO, uh, the Global Internet Policy Observatory, um, which you won't have heard about. Um, but this observatory was, was set up with the idea of um, providing information to all actors, all actors around the world who wanted to find out about internet um, governance, questions that were being discussed at the global level. And one of the reasons for this was that many countries that, that maybe don't have an established framework for understanding or leading or guiding in these areas would tend to go back to their imperial, their, their colonial leaders, right? Um, and would then implement a kind of, um, yeah, post-colonialist version of a digital strategy that had been implemented in the uh, former colonial country, the former colonial master. So there was some sort of neo-colonialism, in the sense, emerging, where, 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 where countries were taking on the flavors, not of their region, which is, you know, what we're seeing now with, with Esquire, there is, there, is, there is a sort of regional specificity, but taking on maybe, well, often always a European um, uh, type of digital strategy, which maybe doesn't fit with the culture and the, the, the engagement actions there. So that's something I wanted to raise, that regional actors can actually bring together the regions right, to actually enable them to work together. And I think that's what Nibal has been saying, what you were referring to, Luis, as well. In your comments. Are there any? If I may, please do go ahead. Um, I mean, there is uh, another. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you, Jamal. And um, I would uh, raise another dimension that uh, there is this regional aspect where we, in a way, uh, interacted with other region, other region, and in a way uh, we uh, copied or we uh, borrowed some of their output in order to bring it to the region. For example, I mean, this is. Something, something that um, sometimes helps a lot. I mean, uh, I would like to say something that we made in the, in the. I was active uh, for a long time in cyber legislation, um, and I would say that we we really uh, took benefit of the all the cyber laws that were, took place in the European Union, and that was, uh, I mean, uh, enacted. I mean, I mean, it was. Uh, uh, drafted and uh, I mean prepared for the EU, and really we were. It was very good. I mean material that to rely on and to 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 have the experience of EU to be copied or to be customized. I would not say that it is copied as it is. It is never as it is, but it is taken uh, taken benefit of this experience, long experience in cyber law. Uh, for example, we did we were uh, enabled to 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 customize it or to to have some lesson learned from from it and to customize it to the Arab region I mean here in this regard and we have in fact in this regard some collaboration with ECA not uh, ECA or some stakeholder in the Africa who have some sub-regional uh, activity in this regard and where it was also interesting to exchange experience and to ex exchange uh, even um, some lesson learned just uh, this is what I want um, to say, um, to, add, to add. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to actually go into the next question so that we have a little bit of time to have a discussion about this. So the third question looks to reflect upon the differences between global discourses on cooperation and practical implementation at various levels from local to regional and beyond. 
And uh, perhaps we'll start with Luis. Perhaps you could mm -hmm. elaborate a little bit about uh, UNU uh, ECOF's um, thoughts and ideas and the study on uh, cooperation. Sure, sure. I, I, I would like to, to stress two aspects that uh, to me are very essential in having um, success in, in, in going ahead with, with, with cooperation and with uh, uh, integration of, of experiences. Um, one is, uh, the, and th this was very clear, for example, from our experience with the uh, Digital Governance West Africa Forum, uh, the need to, to involve other stakeholders rather than governments themselves. This, this has to be a dialogue with multiple voices. Uh, and uh, uh, often, um, this kind of stakeholders coming from the civil society, from the economical, cultural, social uh, ecosystem, make uh, a very interesting contribution in, 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 in fostering synergies and in uh, uh, easing the, 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 the discourse. And the other is the, the, the need to articulate this debate, and this is, uh, was also very clear, for example, in that experience with the, the Lusophone um, African countries, uh, to frame this debate or to articulate this debate with very clear and broader development objectives in terms of uh, um, promoting a digital economy ecosystem and having people motivated from, from, from there. Yeah, this said, of course, there are several ways of, <laughs> of addressing that question and of doing what, uh, of taking this, this, uh, this path. And we, uh, yeah, certainly different regions have different, have different ways and multiple ways to, 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 to articulate uh, different forms of, of governance across uh, different uh, sectors uh, in a more vertical or horizontal way. Uh, we, we had a, a project, uh, um, not, not at that level of, uh, of regional integration, but uh, we conducted a study, actually Morton who is here, conducted that, this study on, on, a, uh, on the different models in different countries, in Asia, in, uh, in Europe, in America, uh, around the organization and the digital transformation of, uh, of uh, social security that uh, may bring some uh, insights on uh, on how this uh, can be uh, at least how, how these things are articulated different uh, different uh, paths uh, i don't know but <laughs> i would suggest that morton can can say something about about that in a, in that perspective uh, thank you Luis. it's it's an interesting issue particularly around the specific elements of governance so uh, obviously classical example is data governance uh, we want an interoperability framework, we want our legal and regulatory framework on a domestic level. But we see even in, particularly in federalized countries like Australia, Canada, Brazil, China, where we were actually supporting uh, the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security on this specific issue, uh, bring some additional complexity that we also see on regional levels, levels of autonomy. My data or the data sovereignty issue as in it is my data as a nation, it is my data as an organization. And we sometimes forget when we talk about this data governance or sovereignty that, well, actually, isn't that what citizens sometimes tell government? That it's not government's data, it's my data, it's data on me, my family, my income. Um, so, so these elements play out. But what we saw very clearly is it's not just about what we're already talking about, about the governance model, about the frameworks, about the legal and regulatory systems and standards, so we can, we can map up the data. It goes to skills, formal internal processes about how, what do we do if we think the data is maybe incorrect? How do we do that formally? How do we report back to the sister agency or the country next door where we get the data and saying, sorry, but you know, Jamal, you don't look 130 years old. And uh, sorry, Morton, why did you have an income of 23 billion last year? That seems a bit odd. What is the process for fixing that so we don't have errors? Because errors are both bad service. It's also bad for decision making. And politically, it's also sensitive because there's nothing worse than telling an old lady that she can't get a, get a pension because she's earning 33 billion euros when in fact she's earning 2300. Um, so those are the type of things that came out very clearly in social security, particularly on the 
on the inter-organizational exchange or even national regional exchange. And then when you see pilots like the Spaniards exchanging data with Uruguay on social security, uh, we see it in a European context or an African context. These elements become even more prevalent and complex because we're not suddenly talking about national partners, we're talking about cross-border partners. Uh, or we talk about federal countries where provinces and state have levels of autonomy, so central government cannot necessarily uh, you know, specify or, or mandate a certain approach. There need to be that flexibility within the framework. So these are some of the things that came out in some very diverse cases from, from China to, to Denmark and, and even looking at the EU influence on national legislation on this topic in, in countries like Denmark and France, where it's very clear that although the national approaches are different, they are aligning to what is thought as being the approach for the region at large. And that then allows that my, my local regional central government data can be exchanged in a meaningful way with a country somewhere else in the region because we have a common framework or a common reference frame about certain things. Thank you for uh, these examples. And I would uh, invite uh, a member of the audience to join us at the microphone if you could share your name and your affiliation. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm Mahesh Perra from Sri Lanka. So I have a question for the esteemed panel. I mean, this is the topic on digital governance. So from Sri Lanka, now we have been trying to uh, digitalize uh, the nation for the last 20 years. Now we have almost drafted a new strategy because citizen in the front, as you said, citizen I mean, it must be all about citizen centricness. Citizen has the control. As you said, I mean, you know, how do you empower the people? How do you strengthen the government? How do you improve competitiveness in businesses? I mean, it's all about this strategy, digitalization of the national strategies. Now, the, the, the question I have for the esteemed panel is, I mean, now, uh, we had a one institution who, who is accountable for this digital transformation, which is not uh, so successful over the last 20 years. Now, when it comes to drafting a new strategy, this strategy must be uh, governed by a set of organization or organizations. So what sort of characteristics or what sort of you know, teeth and muscles this particular inst institution must entail? Uh, I would like to hear you know, different perspectives from the esteemed panel. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Perhaps I'll first uh, turn to Nibal online for your first remarks regarding uh, the questions that were raised. Um, I believe um, this is really uh, this is really very important question, I believe, and it is really for um, many countries, I mean, struggling even with uh, uh, with this, I mean. Uh, I believe that the, uh, such a strategy, whenever the strategy should be really uh, done in, um, formulated in a way, in collective way, and or discussed in collective way before its adoption. This is one of the, the, the lessons that we have learned and when we involve the stakeholder, the different stakeholder in the, at national level for the discussion about any uh, future action that you are doing, especially strategy, it is very important to involve them from the beginning and to have them on board. Maybe they will not draft like you, but I mean, the, like the government, for example, but I mean, they at least they interact with you, they give their idea, and then thereby in later on in the future for the uh, implementation of such a strategy uh, will be much uh, bigger, I mean, and their involvement will be much bigger. Then the involvement of all stakeholders from the beginning, from the start, and to have some interaction with them regularly. Uh, th this is done, I mean, this is first, and I believe there is in such uh, for to have in a way trust in the government, in the public, in the in the, uh, this strategy and it, in its implementation. Uh, we have witnessed, we have noticed that whenever there is a kind of a quick wins in the in the implementation of the strategy or the, in, in the implementation of this uh, uh, transformation, then if there is a quick wins where people see the result of this strategy, uh, they can, uh, uh, I have to say, they, uh, they entrust the government much more and they believe in this and they will be more cooperative uh, with, uh, with, uh, with that. Uh, I believe uh, having a kind of committee or a kind of uh, committee for uh, uh, looking after the implementation at national level, not only 
from the government, I mean, uh, to have a kind of multi-stakeholder committee uh, where uh, many, many, uh, many, uh, uh, part, uh, uh, many partner at national level are uh, involved in this uh, committee, they will uh, uh, to supervise or to follow at least supervise the implementation it will be it is really very important and uh, it uh, gives some credibility to the government as well as um, uh, um, in the process i this is my two cents for the to answer this question Thank you very much. Perhaps I will move yeah. to Luis. Uh, thank you for your question. That, uh, when we go, actually, we have a, a long experience in supporting member states in designing and implementing national strategies for digital governance. We are not a consultancy company, as you know, but we have this mandate of supporting yeah. member states in that direction. And uh, um, y your precise question on the the uh, the who is going to take care of this. It, it, uh, this is crucial, I, I, I think. Um, in terms of, of course, different countries have different suggestions, the, different models. There, there are national agencies, ad hoc commissions, strategy commis committees, whatever. What I think is very important is to have s a clear mandate for whatever m m commission or committee is going to, 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 to go ahead with this. A clear mandate, um, strengthened by a clear political will from government and with technical capacity as well because often we, you get some stakeholders that are more the political representatives of different sectors and this does not go... <laughs> <laughs> the, the other two uh, points that I, I would like to, 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 to emphasize, uh, Nibal has already talked. The, the, the first one is absolutely crucial, the involvement of multiple stakeholders in designing and not only in designing, but also in, in implementing and monitoring the strategy. Uh, I, I used to say with, um, in, in some of the countries that we, we have been supporting, that often the process of thinking about a strategy, designing it, is even more important than the, the final document itself. Because it, 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 it is able to put people in dialogue, to build trust, and to motivate the institutions. Yeah. So we have a, 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 some elements of our experience that I, I'll be happy to share with you if, at, 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 at a later stage. Um, yeah, uh, there was some other aspect that I uh, intended to mention, but actually I, I forgot for the, for the moment. <laughs> but yes. If I, if I may, I, I think as if I put my former Danish civil servant's hat on, working for the Agency for Digitization. I agree with what Luis is saying, but want to add an important detail. One thing that many countries forget in the consultation process is including regional and local authorities. In some countries, local authorities have a very small service delivery role. It may just be f fixing potholes and a few garbage collection things, which are nonetheless essential things in a smart, sustainable city and community context. And often we see, even with infrastructure rollout, such as intra data distribution, uh, electronic service standards, local and regional authorities are utterly forgotten in the national strategies. Um, so, so there are also internal stakeholders. On the mandate, it doesn't matter if it's a Ministry of Sport that has the mandate for digital or if it's an agency for digitization, the name doesn't matter. It's the mandate and the recognition of that mandate. And that requires that there is actually a compliance mechanism. There's a carrot and a stick. Many government agencies, particularly large, traditionally powerful ministries, tend to run circles around newly established agencies for digitization, etc. So. Where you position it is, again, not relevant. It's the mandate and the strength of that carrot and that stick that, that comes with that mandate. So the cross-governmental entities and, and, and collaboration forums are extremely important to get all the ducks lined up in a row. I think German Co Councillor Kohl said it about EU integration. It doesn't matter how big or how small the ships are. As long as they have the same port of destination in mind, and we all get there at some stage. Uh, so that's the same with digitization. So that's really important things, particularly also when we talk about uh, regional cross-border governance, because 
regions and cities are the ones that have neighbors across on the other side. It's not the capital city. Yeah. Thank you very much. As we start going into the, the final moments of our session, I would like to uh, ask uh, Jamal, if you could um, highlight the praxis between the global public good, digital sovereignty and cooperation. Thanks. Uh, Nadia, I will try. Um, <clears throat> and I will use the discussion that we've had uh, a bit just now. And thank you very much for your question. I'll try and uh, incorporate some, some responses in here as well. Um, I think um, one of the things that we realized here is that um, um, regional cooperation works as a kind of uh, two-way mechanism between the uh, national level and the uh, global level. So, so reflecting on how we can filter global norms and global practices, or no, global norms rather, um, and how we can use the national practices uh, to influence or to shape those global norms as well. And I see that that has been one of the, the key issues here, that um, sovereignty in, in the United Nations system, for example, is something that everybody recognizes, right? So sovereignty itself is kind of interconnected, uh, just like the global public good we're trying to, uh, at least conceptually it is. And one of the other things that comes out of these questions about uh, the, the, the regional and the global um, and the shift towards digital transformation, in a sense, that you were talking about, is that regions can help um, with capitalizing on experiences that have taken place elsewhere. So I think a lot of the issues um, that where regions can help, and I know, I know this is how I think ESQA also does work, right, is on the peer review basis, um, this is something that the, the, the European Union has also done. The OECD, okay, while well it's not a territorial regional group, um, the OECD does this. They carry out um, peer review processes, allowing like-minded states or states that have common issues to actually share information. And that, that has been done at the WESIS level, right? But this, this is a massive exercise, right? Um, when trying to, to, to manage that at the WESIS level. The regional level can actually help facilitate that because they can actually bring this stuff forward. And these uh, countries that work to get, that live together do actually share common interests uh, and, and, and common challenges as well. So see that as being very important. Um, also, the, 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 that peer review process, uh, a corollary of that is the common capacity building structures that then emerge. And I think that's very important to, to, to raise here that um, countries will, you know, this is the, the essence. I, I was born in Europe um, and I'm now, again, a European citizen. Um, but um, the, we realized that um, we needed to work together because we could not solve the problems around the world. So that kind of common uh, frameworks actually do actually help in that sense. And then uh, that kind of calls into your pedagogical issues that I think you raised. Um, okay, I'll stop there because I'm, I'm, I need to. Thank you very much. So during this session, we looked at these uh, theoretical concepts of global public good, digital sovereignty, and cooperation, but then also brought that with into practical experience and examples, kind of understanding and allowing us to um, to comprehend how that actually works in practice and the lived experiences of people. Um, Nibal mentioned um, the roadmap uh, that was created, and we hope that that will be shared, and you can find it on the IGF website. Uh, but also, uh, I encourage for you to join all the newsletters to stay up to date on kind of developments that are happening and how you can contribute to projects. But as we uh, enter this last minute of our session, <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, ask um, each of the speakers um, to um, perhaps give one key takeaway and one action point um, from, the, from this session uh, that allows us to think about how do we move forward from here. Um, one key takeaway and one action point. Perhaps we start with Nibal online. Um, <coughs> I, <coughs> I'm sorry to, uh, for that. 
Uh, I think uh, the, the, the most uh, important thing that I would like to say that it is sometimes forgotten is that uh, really that from regional to go to global, that regional actor or not, uh, to, to, to be the voice of the region and to, res to, 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 uh, to make here the, the, the challenges, the, the national, national and regional challenges to, to, to get them to the international uh, fora. I think it is very important to stress on that. Huh? Thank you very much. Perhaps Oka Luis? Two, two very concrete things. Uh, one, to involve academia in this process. We have been making efforts to build uh, networks of universities, to build capacity, but also to, uh, to discuss these issues at a regional level, the continental level, from the point of view of academia. And, uh, and the second is more than a challenge. I think there are a number of emerging, I mean, not emerging because they, are, they have been there for a while, uh, problems, but uh, cr cross-cutting problems related with uh, vulnerable people, displaced people, refugees, that actually require uh, a more global action. And, uh, and this is a challenge, I think, but this level of integration we are discussing. Thank you very much. And Jamal. I'm, I'm, I'm stressing now because I've got minus one minute. Um, the key takeaway that I got is that uh, uh, is really this two-way dialogue, regions shaping but being shaped, right? And the key call to action is um, uh, I really want to pick up on what was said about participation in this, in this framework. I think that um, the multi-stakeholderism, the multi-stakeholder model has been proven to, to, to uh, be worthy of consideration at the global level. This kind of issue at the regional level might be also very interesting to look at. There you go. Thank you very much. So hereby I would like to close this session and thank all the speakers joining here on site and online. Of course the audience that are here and online, but also the staff um, here in Kyoto that are working really hard to make sure that this session is running smoothly. And of course uh, the captioners that make sure that these transcripts become available on the IGF website for, um, for the people who would like to uh, learn more about this topic but we're not able to attend in person so thank you to the captioners and perhaps any translators that have been working um, here with us today so thank i wish you, you all um, a really really lovely uh, final day of uh, the igf and i look forward to seeing you the next time thank you very much